dive right into this. All right. Hi, this is Paul. And with me today is and now I don't know how Latin I should make your last name. Enriquez or it's actually, yeah, well, be, my answers have been here for a while. So it's now Henriquez. Henriquez. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, ar around here in California, I learned very quickly that when I came from Latin America, not to, to I had to make sure to anglicize all sorts of things like San, you know, San Jose and yep. <laughs> Sacramento. So Greg, uh, Greg was um, introduced to me by John Verveke. And you've had some talks with John Verveke and you've worked with him on some things. And Absolutely. so he sent me a little bit of material, but I don't really know much about his stuff. And part of that's conscious for me because I think many of my audience doesn't know who you are. So we'll just let this conversation flow naturally. So that thanks for great, coming man. out. Hey, it's really an honor to be here. And, uh, you know, I appreciated the connections that you've had with John. And, uh, you know, he said, a new now dear friend to me. And uh, I've really appreciated the conversations that you've had and some of your work. So uh, it's a real honor to be here and I'm glad to get uh, connected. Well, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I already warned you that what I was gonna do because that's sort of what I do on my channel because in my experience, people won't care much about your ideas and till and unless they have a certain sense of who you are. So let's let's begin with probably a little bit more introduction than is normal for these channels. So tell me about where you grew up, what your family was like, religious ideas, that whole business. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in sort of a, a upper middle class, white privileged context. Uh, my, both my dad was a professor uh, at, at George Mason University. Um, he actually had an evangelical conversion at a, a Billy Graham concert. Really? <laughs> and so he woke up, saw the light, uh, found Christ, and was on his way to the ministry uh, until he got to the place where he didn't really like predetermination, predestination, had some issues with free will kinds of dynamics. And then sort of that, that was a tipping point for him. Uh, my mom was sort of raised Catholic, but neutral. And so she would follow, he was more leading along those lines. And then as he shifted, he then found his way in, back into sort of secular academy and became a history professor. Oh, um, really? So uh, we have that history. And so then I got raised uh, with kind of a Dawkins-esque atheism, you know, pretty kind of critical, uh, skeptical view of, of that with a really strong bent toward empiricism, modernism, naturalist kind of thinking. <clears throat> I had three brothers. Uh, my mom uh, was an accomplished uh, kindergarten teacher and then actually became also a adjunct professor. So, you know, we value education. And um, when I, you know, I grew up in Northern Virginia, so it's about an hour and a half, hour outside of DC or so, uh, Washington, DC. Uh, and then um, I was always just sort of interested in psychology as a, like, what is human nature? You know, well, how do we understand the human mind, and I really like talking to people about what mattered. So um, that was, uh, it, or I took a psychology course in my undergrad, I mean, in my high school, actually, and then uh, majored and went to James Madison, which I'm actually now a professor at James Madison University. Wow. So uh, you're, you're really in that, uh, <laughs> that yeah. LU. I'm really in that really, I've been basically right. I, I've been basically in the academy my whole life. And now I kind of refer to it as, oh no, the academy is like a blue church to use Jordan <laughs> Hall's term. Yeah. Okay? And I'm like, the entire system's in need of an upgrade. I'm kind of gotten jettisoned out all of the traditional academic ways of thinking. And now I kind of think differently about the world, which has been an interesting journey. Well, how, well, how did that journey take place? Because yeah. again, if you're a product of the blue church, everyone would expect you to be a product of the blue church. But now it sounds like you're a little bit uh, of a heretic in the blue church. Well, so you should know something about exoduses and heretics. Yeah, right? yeah, they're, yeah. They're like, <laughs> that's they're like why stories I, along those lines. That's that's exactly <laughs> why I want to know. That's exactly <laughs> what I want to know. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. So, yeah. right. And I have this garden, weird garden thing behind me. Yeah. You know, and you send me stuff with like the tree of life on. It's like, oh. yeah, actually. Yeah. Tree of knowledge, tree of the, the garden and all that. I, I return back to some of the mythopoetic roots and blend science and humanism and, and theology kind of together in some weird new worldview. It's crazy. <laughs> so let's, so let's hear it. How did, how did this get started? How did you become yeah. the heretic that you are? 
So, so I was a, I was a standard, you know, blue church believer in empirical psychology as an undergrad. I took 60 credits. Um, I got, I, I woke up into feminism. So my mentor was a sociologist. I learned about feminism. Um, I had three other brothers, um, believed very much in uh, sort of equality. And then in retrospect, as I learned about feminism, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of masculine dominated normative themes here. That's trouble. Uh, so I sort of got woke up to critical theory and had my, you know, I was woke back then. And now I'm like, gosh, this stuff's crazy. <laughs> but anyway, so that's part of my journey. I, was, I learned into that. And my mom and I actually connected some around some of that stuff. Um, so I was sort of normal uh, in terms of just convention, believed in science and, and all of that stuff. Um, I then went to the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, whereby I got my master's degree in clinical community psychology. Uh, and uh, then I got, it was there that I got my second intellectual bump and that was in the therapy room, okay? Uh, so when you actually sit with real people in real context, <laughs> It's a little different. That's right. right. <laughs> Suddenly the world gets, even though you imagine in the academy, we've got our handle on the big world. And then you go and you talk to real people. It's like, wait a minute. Well, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. So this is, so, and then what I see, I, I get fortunate. Uh, so much in the academy are uh, like when you're actually getting trained academically, it's very common for you to get channeled into a particular school of thought, like you're right. going to be a behaviorist or cognitive behaviorist or humanist or Freudian or whatever. I was fortunate where uh, my training system was uh, appreciative of the pluralism. So yeah. they were like, hey, there's these different approaches. So they weren't dogmatic. And they held in high esteem each of the various approaches and showed how when each were done by the best of the best, they have a lot of value in them and yeah. encouraged us to then uh, sort of take an ecumenical <laughs> approach okay. in relation, you know, and see the value of the various perspectives. Um, and I, I internalized that and saw that and felt that. Um, and so what I like to say happened is, so I had my feminine uh, and feminist therapist heart as I work with suffering and downtrodden people. And then I have my physicist head, okay, which is sort of like, huh, I want coherence to allow me to draw with logic and clarity the best of the best um, with some degree so that I could bring my knowledge to inform us in the th real world therapy room with wisdom. But I, I'm a, what's called a coherentist in terms of my disposition, which means I really like things to make sense. Uh, I, like the, I like music rather than noise, as it were. Uh, at a pretty high level of abstraction, I started thinking along those lines. And I also became very aware that really it's the theoretical, you know, worldview structure that you bring that really serves as the mediating position between whatever they say the empirical research is. So you find all these empirical research studies, but you have to organize those empirical research studies into theory that then informs your practice. So theory is really the conduit between empirical findings and practice. And so then I asked the question, well, what is the theory that I bring to bear uh, or worldview um, or understanding that I bring to bear in psychology to inform my work in psychotherapy. Um, so this is 1994-ish, okay. okay? Um, and I did something that was kind of crazy that it turned out, okay? This is when, this is when I start to d d disconnect from my church. Okay. <laughs> All right. I basically said, huh, so what is the theory? What's the theoretical structure of psychology at a big picture level? All right. Well, you asked that. That turns out to be a very dangerous question, Paul. <laughs> I can okay. imagine. Well, yeah. people yeah. don't, I mean, Jordan Peterson says people don't like being poked in their axioms and that it very <laughs> much goes true for academics as well. Totally. Totally. And an axiom in psychology that is, is that there is no theory of psychology. So that's an axiom. <laughs> it's so, just yeah, truth. It okay. just is true. So now it's true. <laughs> and if you start saying, well, if you start highlighting both that, that actually we historically, the field tried to do a big picture and then it broke. And then we all just agreed that there is no big picture and don't ever have any, any of the students that come to mass. Like, Why isn't there like a theory of psychology? Oh, we pat them on the head and we say, oh, that's a naive question. Why would you ask such a question? What we do is we apply the scientific method 
to human behavior, right. and then we gather data. And it depends on, you know, you create your operational definitions. Some naive children want theory, but we know that that, that we put you to bed. It's just science, okay? It's just, just science. Just science. Right, exactly. So, it's, but, but, it, but like my therapist, I was like, wait a minute. It, given that everything depends on all of decisions you make on your operational definitions in your program of research, that's not science that makes you decide that. It's just that you, you have your data point process, but I want to understand that doorway enter the frame that you're using to understand. And I want to understand some macro frame so I have some coherence. And then it was like, well, nobody has that and you shouldn't ask that question. I was like, what? <laughs> Okay, so you bumped into a a, a a horrible dogma that's out there because we all have to be a, suspicious of dogma. The blue church has got its dogmas, and I was like, <laughs> "Oh my gosh, this is really weird," you know. So, it, so that was, and then so then I I then found that there was this you know that there was think evolutionary psychology. There was this discipline that was trying to get its chops organized, and some of the people said, "Hey, this actually may provide a big picture view." I was interested in that. Um, and then in 1996, I had an insight that showed why that wasn't going to work, but that there was another pathway. And, um, and ultimately, then in 1997, I got the outline of what would become the tree of knowledge. And yes, I ended up naming it that way because I, I got tossed into a whole new way of thinking about the world. And in the last 20 years, I then built the thing called the tree of knowledge, which says, actually, we can uh, develop a big picture theory of psychology. And that's just has kept grown to become this whole new scientific humanistic worldview and this uh, unified theory of knowledge or garden philosophy. And uh, that's philosophy. what makes me a very odd uh, academic is that I built this new worldview philosophy system. Okay, so, so where, do you, where do you want to, um, well, well, let me ask you this question. I mean, you still teach, so did, have you gotten tenure yet or is, are they dangling <laughs> that out in front of you? No, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I fit, so, you know, um, I ended up coming to James Madison's as a unique program. It's an innovative applied program and what's called combined integrated psychology on the professional side. So I trained psychological doctors. Okay. okay? Um, I got hired here for my theory in 2003. So that was a very... I was told by my dissertation advisor, and I love him, but he was like, you'll never get a job doing theory. And he would have been right under most circumstances, but I got to call him and say, I got a job because of my theory, Harold. And so it was a <laughs> funny, funny point of my life. Of course, everywhere else I applied, I talked about all my empirical research that I also had to do, um, which is interesting stories on and of itself. I work with Beck, if you know anything about cognitive therapy, if you've heard of cognitive therapy yep. at all. Anyway, he's the, one of the founding fathers of that. I worked with him for four years and uh, it worked in people who made suicide attempts and worked in very, very difficult life situations and tried to do therapy there. Um, but then, yes, I went and got my tenure job and then got tenure and associate professor and full, full professor. So I am free, Paul. You are you're free to I'm say a, what you want. I, I, if I'm fr the nice thing about the academy is it does allow, within limits, but it does still uh, somewhat advocate for free critical thinking and ideas and new places. And uh, so I'm well established and I'm able to then, and that's what allows me to sort of like see John Verbeke and be like, hey, I don't need to write papers. I'll just have conversations with John. You know, that's cool. <laughs> it's a lot easier. <laughs> it's a lot easier, no peer review. I can just say, trust me, it's good. That's right. <laughs> So, so, so why, why do you want to talk to a Calvinist minister in California? What are we, what are we going to talk about now? Yeah. Um, um, uh, what what well, do you bring, what do you bring to, cause, cause my audience is very eclectic. Cause I started totally. this with Jordan Peterson and, and because Jordan Peterson is so broad, I've sort of got, you know, obviously the Christian stuff that I talk about, yeah. but then John Verveke and the religion that isn't a religion. And so I'm, I'm all over the map. And so I'm not, I'm not quite sure where we're going to go with this. So what, 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 what's on your mind? Okay. So here's the basic bridge that, and then we can see that I see lots. So I'll just throw out some topics and we can see where we want to go with this. And, um, so first off, I think that John is onto something very, very important. John Verveke. Okay. Uh, and I think that we need a fundamentally new set of conversations about lots of things. Science, wisdom, and spirituality are top three. Okay? Uh, so if you're interested in thinking about our worldviews and how science and spirituality intersect and what, is, uh, what we need to do for the 21st century, then you're definitely in my ballpark. I feel like you're in that ballpark. Okay. Okay. 
so your uh, I what jo what Jordan Peterson represented and the Jordan Peterson phenomena I am totally fascinated by. Okay. Well, uh, so you I and I are on the same page then. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're and and what I loved his Bible series. I think that he positioned psychology and biblical theology brilliantly in relation. And so you and I can have some conversations from our various vantage points in relationship. I've seen some of the work that you did on reviewing his Bible series and have lots of, uh, both of you have far more biblical knowledge than I do, but I have my knowledge enough. And I really want to see that intersection much more uh, explored with much more richness and texture and detail from a number of different perspectives. I love the way he framed his Bible series. I loved your analysis of, of major parts of it. Uh, so that's another possibility. I have my, I have the exact same training as Jordan Peterson does. So I'm a clinical theoretical personality psychologist. Um, so that may be of interest. You know, it's been an interesting road for me to watch his uh, flash across uh, society. I've made uh, some, I've done some blogs on that. I've got a lot to say about that. I was impacted by, I got into a fight with my program about him, which is an interesting uh, side note in terms of what he represented. So um, I have, I have huge amounts of fascination with the Jordan Peterson phenomenon. I'd love to. Well, let's, let's start there then. Because so, uh, when did you first, I mean, did you know about Jordan in terms of his academic work before he hit the whole culture war thing? Uh, only indirectly. Uh, there was some work he'd done on personality theory that I had intersected with really not, of course, not knowing who he was, just another academic. Uh, there's some uh, work on the intersection of big five and some stuff that I was uh, tracked on his, you know, so we just intersected that way very indirectly. So I may have known the name Jordan Peterson and some of the big five facet work that he did, but that is it. Uh, and then it wasn't until um, basically after he was starting to explode upon the scene that I then caught whiff. So this is after C-16 uh, and the controversy. It was within a couple of months of that. So maybe late 2017 or so, or I mean, maybe, you know, maybe a I don't remember exactly the dead, but it was, he was already rising up. It was clear that the controversy happened. I had knew about him just before the Kathy Newman interview. So um, I was on, I was in the stream by the time the Kathy Newman interview happened, but maybe only for a month or two. Uh, if we, I, I think that's in like late 2016, 2017. I'd have to go back and look. The, at the Kathy Newman interview was January 2018. 18, which, right. Because okay, it, so was in, it was in, it was just in the, right. it was part of the bringing out of That's his right. book. Now I'm curious, how did you hear about him? Was it from students? Was it from media? Media. I, I heard about it from media. Uh, and, um, and then I quickly brought him to some of my students as we started to look at it. And that started to generate some heat that I was actually surprised by. Meaning that people were like, huh, this guy's a bad character. Cause I immediately huh. did not see him as a bad character. And, but other people clearly did. And why was that? Because, because basically, I, I, I mean, my, I'm inside the Academy. My right. experience inside the Academy is that there is a, you know there's a woke religion that is yeah. happening. Okay. Yep. Uh, and, you know, I don't mean that judgmentally. I just mean descriptively. You know, yep. It obviously carries a bit of a judgmental tone, but there was really a foundational awakening about justice and diversity and equity. Some people call it the Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion um, uh, ideas. Okay. Uh, and they're powerful and strong, and I will critique them strongly, but I will also, whatever, we can talk about them. Um, and so many people will fall right in line with the leftist media characterization. So if you had a negative leftist media characterization that he's a transphobe and that he is a conservative and that he's hostile uh, to rights, you know, many people will quickly have internalized that. And, yeah. and, and in the academy will, uh, you know, sort of say that's a given. And yeah. my, then I learned enough about him to be like, oh my God, that's insane. That's not what he's about at all. You know, that's like, <laughs> like that's just a caricature. And now, and then my whole point was, well, we should be able to diagnose, you know, shallow framing on an individual that's politically motivated, okay? But not everybody saw it that way. <laughs> no, no, that's not everybody saw it that way. In fact, I'd say just uh, just a minority of people look at him and say, 
you know, watch all of this meet and say, I don't think you've got him right. <laughs> so what did you see about him that you said this, 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 these labels they are putting totally. on him are not what he is about? Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, as I told my would tell people, well, if he's a fraud, I'm a fraud. Okay, so that's the first thing. I mean, he's a serious thinker. Okay, um, so what do I mean by that? Well, maps of meaning. I mean, I went out and got because I can read that book with a lot of ease. You know, it's a complicated book, but I have the background. I can read it and right. know what he's talking about right. very quickly. And a lot of us show, can't. So no, I mean, you listen. That's a hard. If you don't have the architecture, it's a hard book to follow. You know, yeah. there's a lot of layers that he's stacked on. So here's what I see in him, and this is my own. And I've already gone through this. So he's first off, he's a clinician. He does three, fills three deep boxes and then a fourth. Okay. So he's a clinician. I respect that. And he's a deep clinician, you know, as far as I can tell. I mean, he, I, he goes about the work a little differently than I do, but that's what it's an artistry craft. Yep. Everyone does it a little differently. Okay. So he's also a theorist. I mean, he's well read. I mean, he knows, you know, he, he, under, he looks into all sorts of different things. He has access to Nietzsche, he has access. I know he's simple on stick on Marx, but he's got access to a wide variety of different knowledge systems. Yep. Okay. He's also an empirical researcher. I mean, he, he understands the scientific method and he, he respects it. Uh, and he is anchored to behavioral science methodology at a very high level, has published at a very high level and has occupied, um, you know, serious academic positions and, and would be in the top 1% or whatever of, uh, academic publishers, that, or, you know, whatever metric I don't want to put it, but he's a serious player. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you're a serious clinician, you're a serious theorist, and you know behavioral science, I know that background. That's damn impressive. Not too many people play all three of those things. Right. Okay? Right. And then you see him get up on a stage and command with charisma a particular way of articulating things, like he's an excellent instructor, as far as I was concerned. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And his his diagnosis of where we are, where the academy is in terms of, wait a minute, we are, we have taken a pill of a woke religion, but let's be, at least be aware of that, people. <laughs> I mean, you agree or not, that's actually just descriptively true, let's be right. aware, right? So he makes that point, um, and then he brings a, a huge articulation that I feel that we need to think seriously about where we are in terms of our theology, where we are in terms of our science, where are we headed in terms of our values, um, and we, it's time to have an engagement about this. And I don't think we're doing it very sophisticatedly. So I yeah. agree with all of that uh, in relation. And that's why I was then fascinated to see that that position, although I understand why he poked the bear and that sometimes I wish he didn't, but of course that's part of the phenomenon. We yeah. can talk about that, but it's like, you know, that position should not be a lightning rod of controversy. <laughs> I mean, right. that basically, that should be like, yes, actually, if we wake up and see the, where we are, we should all be loading, you know, organized towards, actually, I hope we evolve into deep, rich wisdom and reflection in relationship to that. And in fact, what we saw is basically a fracturing, shallow, acrimonious uh, reactivity uh, that really is diagnostic of a sociocultural, ideological, you know, breakdown, polarization, fragmentation, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's part of what's interesting to me about Jordan is that we wouldn't have we wouldn't have known about him, and you know I, I mean when I had my little conversation conversation with him in April of twenty eighteen, I got to keep my dates right. Um, no, April of twenty seventeen, I think it was. I'm not sure. Um, if he hadn't, if he hadn't poked the bear, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, Maps of Meaning was out in 99 and I never heard of the book. Nobody I knew ever heard of the book. Now I'm in a different section of the world. I had never heard of the book. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a pretty close to a section. Yeah. And if he, I mean, it, it said something to me that, well, you're a clinician. You under, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm a pastor. But I know people well enough to know that when you touch a nerve, 
you've touched a nerve and there's something going on. <laughs> there's no doubt that he touched a nerve. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> so and that's the beauty of it. It's fascinating. So, so where for you is the, is sort of the intersection between, and, and, you know, his, his nerve, there, there's a debate in the, in the, in the Jordan Peterson nerditry to the okay. degree to which he was calculating in this nerve touching and the degree to which the man in the moment found each other, you know, with partly with, you got Trump in the background and all of that, because, of you know, he no, had been deal. on Ontario public television. I mean, he was, yeah. he was a kind of a cult a uh, leader in terms of a professor, you know, his department head has concerns about him because he's curious about buying a, you know, a, a church that had gone out of business maybe and, you know, holding forth on Sunday. So, you know, he, there is that stuff about him already, yeah. but nothing like the explosion that we saw. Totally, totally. No, so, he, uh, so where's the intersection I mean, he, between those two things that you saw? Well, well okay. So, to me, he, like I said, he, he, he's a deep guy that's got a lot of interesting things to say and he does it charismatically. So that's the backdrop, but that's a lot of people. I mean, you know, way more, there are way more people out there than are actually known. Right? Oh yes. So he, that's, yep. the, that's obviously, that's the potential. So he creates- And universities potential. are full of them. There, you know, there are many oh. people in university that are smart, well-read, articulate, charismatic. Hey. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, so, you know, there are. That's absolutely true. Why well, didn't so you protest C-16? You know, that's a whole, right. That's a whole complicated network. Um, but I, I certainly appreciated his position in relationship to that. And so you have this potential. And then really, I mean, the combustible intersection of his chops and his yep. depth and his potential to the, but then the wave of religion that is that is occupying and his willingness to stand up and the way he stood up and the archetypal sort of crotchety old white guy standing up but with depth against the progressive masses yep, just yep. boom i mean that is a lightning rod that just had so much energy in it yeah. you know that that just collapsed everybody's attention and there were enough people that were super polarized about it Mm -hmm. um that 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 the polarized charge centered around him in a just a unique i mean just a unique yeah. way uh, yeah. and and i think that it's common i don't think he certainly strategically i mean if you listen to him he certainly wasn't like anticipating that he would become the most popular i mean i'm sure he had some fantasies about getting lots of influence most people you know that sure. trying to get influence do sure. but he wasn't being strategic he did he unlocked a lightning storm of potential and then he did poke it a couple of times easily yeah. he would have had to been very very restrained not to poke it but yeah. these people are poking at him so yeah. and he's you know he's defensive and clear and critical and, and all of that and he'll poke back and uh and was fine playing that role but in the such a polarized system it just generated so many waves i mean it was really remarkable yeah yeah no and i as a pastor I saw the same thing. I mean, I, I heard about him in the wake of C-16 and then, all right, there's a culture war fight. As a pastor, I'm a little, you know, with my own story, I'm a little bit to the side of it. I certainly had interest in, you know, the race conversations yeah. because that's very much the context in which I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, but I had seen in our culture um, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm interested, I'll be interested to hear what you, you have to say about this too, because in our culture, I saw so much church work as, well, it's interesting, you know, I, I don't, when, when you touched on your father's conversion and then, um, that is not an uncommon thing in our culture mm -hmm. that, that people, you know, especially with sort of the, the, you know, the, you have the Billy Graham crusade, you have, you know, the, the whole history of revivalism in America, um, where people will hit a moment of crisis and then, you know, it might be an evangelist or a preacher or mm -hmm. a, a congregation and they hit that crisis and, and, and right there they find an answer. And then if at least the, the church system is working well, um, that person can then be enfolded. And, and right away I saw, sort of a, 
uh, relationship between what is happening with Jordan Peterson and with Billy Graham. And I use that. Mm. I, I compared that quite often because part of the reason I got into this was mm -hmm. I knew when a crusade comes to town, I came in, the, I came in after the whole crusade business had really had right. its heyday. Okay. Mm -hmm. But even when these B level crusaders would come into town i get all these phone calls and things from the greg lowry crusade or the mm -hmm. you know all, all these days because we want churches lined up because they know you can bring in a dynamic speaker you can bring people to a moment but if you can't connect them up right. to a community mm -hmm. and you know as john verveke would talk about practices which <laughs> so often in in protestantism have been deeply implicit um if you can't mm -hmm if you can't connect people into a web, you know, they'll have a moment and then, you know, then they just kind of continue right. to just float out there. So myself yeah. as a pastor, I saw what was happening around Jordan Peterson. And I said, as, as a dramatically unsuccessful evangelist, um, mm. <laughs> uh, this, this is low hanging fruit. This is fish mm. in a barrel. You know, the, these people are going to come away from Jordan Peterson saying, what's next? Right. And I want to say, here's something you should think about. Beautiful. Yeah. And and Amen. so that's that's how I got into this. Yeah. Well, I actually, I, that's funny because I'm, I'm, I consider myself sort of on the very, on the psychological side of that equation, you know, because as yep. a deep therapist who has my own frame of reference for how to think about psychology, um, I see Jordan as having some really key insights, but there's also more insights to come and indeed more insights to potentially bridge and build and to synthesize. Uh, so if I hear him talking with Brett Weinstein and Sam Harris, you know, as an evolutionary biologist and, you know, a neuroscientist and they're up on stage, I've got my own structures like, no, oh, actually I can synthesize all of this a lot better than that conversation. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, that's a lot of, a lot of similarities. Is Sam Harris really a neuroscientist? I mean, come <laughs> on. He's, <laughs> I, should, I should be nicer to Sam Harris, but he, he strikes, because I, he strikes me much more as someone in a religious community, yeah. ironically, <laughs> but that he, he strikes me much more in the, in terms of someone on stage who is promoting a worldview and attracting a following and writing books in order to support those people. I work in that world all the time. And so when I see <laughs> Sam Harris, it's like, I know scientists and you're kind of more, you kind of have more like my job. That's what yeah. I see. But anyway, um, right so, <laughs> well, that's, well, that's really interesting. So, so when Peterson, why, why knowing what you know, were the biblical lectures so integral you know, so there's a whole bunch of the political chatter yep. around Peterson, and that's all getting stirred up again. And that's part of this dynamic. But my area, you know, a lot of us, just like you said, would sort of wish he'd just kind of distance himself from, you know, don't, don't, I understand how poking the bear has got you this far. And, and part of that is in you. And if, and, and I don't know if, I don't know if you were, but if I was this pastor, I'd say, Jordan, don't talk to the newspapers, you know, <laughs> don't, you know, work on your biblical stuff, write your books, you know, attend to your crowd, do your conversations. But this, this politics stuff, you, you know, we all, we all have a right to our own politics and I get that. And you have a right to participate. And I appreciate the fact that as a young man, politics were his interest, but it almost killed you, buddy. <laughs> it almost killed you. And so to me, the, okay, so here is just surprising that a psychology professor would be kvetching about pronouns. That took me by surprise. And then when he was doing the biblical lectures, it's like, and then I thought, okay, some evangelical kind of kept his head down at University of Toronto. And so that's why he's against it. And then I listened to his psychology lectures and it's as biblical lectures like, no, this is no evangelical. <laughs> this, is, this is this is something like I haven't actually seen. Now, now they've been out there in all fairness. Uh -huh. And but uh -huh. what did you see? Why do you think he did the biblical lectures? And how does that fit into this framework? I mean, I think that's his passion. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that's one of his. I think his fundamental intellectual uncertainty. I, I basically I mean, you know, you ask, uh, does he believe in God? Does he believe? 
I think that he's sort of a spiritual agnostic, basically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that he is fundamental, you know, his fundamental fascination, he says this, and I, and I take him at his word, and I think there's, and this fascinates me, why have these stories carried the impact that they have carried in Western civil, or civilization in general, Western civilization in particular, if we talk about the Bible? Why is that? That's a brilliant and beautiful question, I think. Um, and I think it's a serious academic question. I think it's a serious spiritual question. I think that psychology has been, uh, should be asking that question. And, it, and it's an abject fail. I think that my discipline is having a number of abject failures, you know, and certainly we have a psychology of religion, but at least what I saw him do in relationship to the analysis of, of the Bible in those lectures was as riveting and interesting of an analysis of a theoretical clinical personality psychologist exploring with openness the possible archetypal meaning of what these could mean and be open to what they mean spiritually, be open to what they mean culturally, think seriously about how to honor them and learn about what's sacred in relationship to them, learn about our own human psychology from them and open up serious interprofessional interdisciplinary you know, sciences to humanities dialogues about one of the most important, you know, series of narratives that are world defining and certainly defining of our culture. I mean, I think that's absolutely central. Uh, I learned a lot. I, it obviously, it packed in a whole bunch of people. <laughs> you know, yeah. A lot of people were really fascinated by it. And I believe that we're in the midst of a serious, you know, this is John Berbeke, we're in a chirotic moment. There's a real reason of our searching for worldviews, we're trying to figure out the meaning crisis, okay? Um, and I believe, you know, for me, the digital, the virtual world, okay, the mediums uh, of, of the world are changing so radically. There are very good reasons to believe that the medium change will fundamentally change our structure, architecture, internally and between people, okay? Um, and yeah. that means we're in a lot of flux, I, you know, and I can talk about why I, exactly how I frame that, but a Marsha McLuhan version or whatever, there are say, lots of ways to say our lives are in flux, okay? Our meaning systems are breaking and confused. We need a lot of leadership around how to bring wise worldviews together and to try to figure out ways to relate to them and then relate to each other and relate to the planet. And we, we, need, we can do a lot better than we're doing. Um, and I see the Jordan Peterson lecture series as exactly the kind of work um, that is advantageous, and useful, insightful, healthy, um, and good at multiple levels. So that's, that, that certainly draws me uh, in that regard. Part, part of what Peterson and what he did and what he sparked and what he didn't do led me to ask some questions about institutions. Again, okay. because part of why I jumped into this was I said, again, there's going to be a lot of people floating around in the aftermath of these things that he's doing. Yeah. And I just anecdotally saw people wanted to talk about this yeah. and there was no space for them to process. And so then I started, you know, some meetups. Yeah. Um, I started a local meetup and then some of the people in my local meetup, we started a discord server. And so we've done some of those things. Mm -hmm. And I also leveraged basically my church network. Cause I could, unlike a lot of people, I could get free space because mm -hmm. the Christian Forum church is small enough that if I call another right. CRC pastor and say, Hey, can I have a room this Friday night? Cause I want to mm -hmm. meet with a bunch of people and they'll say, oh, nothing's going on. Sure. That's fine. And um, so I could get free space. And so before COVID, I was doing a little bit of traveling, trying to help get meetings going. I also noticed that um, a lot of other meetups were happening around Jordan, but most of them would sort of open and close pretty quickly. And as a pastor, I could understand that because I, as a in, a, in church world, you understand group dynamics, you know, what it, what it takes, how to sort of manage a conversation, some of these kinds of things, how to develop leaders, how to, how to build a network, because that's what churches yep. do. Yep. And, um, and so I, again, I sort of saw Jordan wasn't doing any of this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I mean, he was doing a book tour. He was selling books. Right. He was putting stuff on YouTube and all that was great. You know, one person can't do anything. Whereas for example, the Billy Graham society, they, you know, they had learned how to <laughs> institutionalize and structure and facilitate and, you know, all yeah. of the levels, if you want to actually sustain a movement or sustain a conversation, totally, you need all of these things. And so, right. You know, I, I'm really impressed by what you just said right now in terms of these are these are and and I think you know this is where I saw John Verveke coming in with a much yep. different um, approach. Yep. Um, but there's there's very much the sense that the academy is not going to be the institution to facilitate this. Right. Which which breaks my heart. Right. And, I, and, and I'm sort of sitting here, you know, when I saw the Jordan Peterson stuff happen, I thought, I don't know why there isn't a line miles long of people doing exactly what I'm doing, because to me, it looks like the most obvious thing in the world, because we have all of these facilities and experience to, 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 to latch into this conversation. And I look around and pastors are, they're all busy with all their little things. It's like, so so to me, the question is, okay, at what level and via which institutions or even which media do we begin to at least address these big issues? Because the I don't see the academy as doing it. I don't see the church as taking it seriously. And so, you know, here I'm talking to, you know, professors and business yep. people, you know, people all over the place. Because what we don't have is really a sustainable structure or institution to begin to facilitate this kind of thing. Beautiful, and, and beautiful. In fact, that's why I wanted to talk. I mean, this is, this is because, um, because I heard John Verveke narrate what he was trying to do with psychotechnologies, right? And I heard him acknowledge your point, which you just mentioned also is like, actually it's about community, John, <laughs> not just meditating to yourself, although it's important, right? But it's fundamentally, and that's absolutely what we need. In fact, I'm given a presentation at the STOA um, with like Jordan Hall and Jamie Wheel and Zach Stein, a few other people on Monday, and it's about wisdom commons. Like how do we cultivate a wisdom commons, okay? Um, and, and for me, the issue is like in the academy, you get, we have your classes and you have your silos and you have your specialty and you go and you narrate why your, why your traditional specialty, you know, converse broadcast knowledge based on what it is that you're doing. It's, it, it was, there was nowhere to have a conversation about what was going on in the world, right? There, there was, there was no, sense that hey we should get together and have a dia logos <laughs> out of out of a bunch of professors yeah. get together what does this mean about our culture about yeah. our knowledge about science and about religion about how do we actually you know uh, and and this is what's absolutely necessary to me to yeah. to create a catalyst for the kind of cultural transition that we're in the midst of yeah. it's finding out these emerging kinds of things so your sense and sensibility on what actually needed to emerge as a kind of connections, so that's I guess what I detected through John and his discussion, and why I wanted to hook up. Because to me, that is that's the essence of the actual practices that need to be embodied, and we should do what we can to light them and spread them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I, you know, it, it's an, it's interesting to me. So watching Jordan's trajectory. So of course, he he has a sabbatical or a leave of absence. You know, when he in 2018 to do his book, and then. Midway through 2019, he, you know, has the benzo withdrawal, and so he's out of action until just recently. But the, I mean, it was it was instructive to me when he, you know, a petition goes around the University of Toronto, you know, he should be, you know, he should be sacked, and it's like. Wow, <laughs> no, that 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 is telling about that institution. But you know, not to not to you know point fingers at the academy. The church has 
when I say the church, even what, I mean, it's so fractured and fragmented, but we can fractured and fragmented or diverse. You can use either word. Um, (laughs) but But the church has in many ways been stewarding pieces of these conversations too Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because churches churches tend to very much sort of be frontline organizations they have um you know they have connections to society at least in you know in the united states they long have that's increasingly disintermediated as more and more of the population no longer relates to church and a lot Mm. of my critique has been whereas you know, pastors might complain and lament and, you know, because they're losing, they're losing cultural, they're losing cultural influence, especially in some of the most uh, influ, oh boy, this stuff gets complicated. <laughs> so, so uh, the, the church is underperformed. The academy seems, you know, almost allergic to this conversation. Now, now, oh, it is. Now, fortunately, John, you know, John is now tenured and John seems to have a good relationship with the University of Toronto, which I think is excellent. And I think John quite wisely has been very careful with some of the, you know, you poke certain bears and your employers aren't going to necessarily like it so much. But and John hasn't really gone there. But again, and, and I know John's working out, you've got the Stoa, you've got Rebel Wisdom, and we've sort of had these little hodgepodge things out there. But, yep. but to me, a lot of it was, a lot of it was analogous to, you know, let's, let's imagine there were a group, I'm sure there were, there were a group of epidemiologists who early on were watching China and seeing, oh boy, this, this is going to hit and it's going to hit hard. And so we have to be ready and well, they may have a YouTube channel or a blog and then the pandemic hits and, you know, the academy, the churches, the government are all completely caught unaware. So, and, and to me, in terms of where we're at right now in this conversation, that's sort of where we're at. We got a few yeah. YouTube channels. We got a few blogs. We got a few people here and there, but yeah. nothing, nothing comparable to the level of the level of crisis as a society that we are dealing with the thing is that a pandemic is fast yes and what we're dealing with is slow i don't know if that i don't know if that rings true to you no it rings absolutely true so a couple of riff off a couple of points uh, in relationship to it so um i mean i really believe that we need a conscious evolution awakening like there's a we need to wake up and the sensibilities that have been guiding us okay uh for the 20th century are not up to the task of the problems and nature of the world we're living in now so we really that and that's a that's a very scary thing paul because the as you know you don't just all of a sudden create a new worldview in like 10 years okay that's not the way worldviews work, right? I mean, you know, these things take a long time, yet I don't think we have 200 years. <laughs> I mean, we're literally, I mean, I don't know if the world's going to collapse, but the vulnerability that it might collapse, and at the very least, the numbers of people with meaning crises and, and feeling relative to our potential well, feeling unbelievably impoverished in their souls and, and completely disconnected and completely confused in relationship to the meaning of their lives and how they should connect to other people and what is actually going on in the world. For me, it's just unbelievably tragic that we, relative to our potential, we are, we're just missing the mark over and over again, and we're creating more and more vulnerabilities. And we have to fundamentally create a healing movement that changes our relationship to each other, to technology and the world and the planet. And, 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 and all, what I would look at is I'd look at Jordan Peterson and go, oh, what should have happened is that's a nice little signal that we should wake up and do shit. Instead, what happens is, oh, it just shows how crazy and polarized everybody is. It's like, it's just diagnostic. And of course, then we have the pandemic. We have what Trump does. I mean, the world, you know, especially the United States, you're just like, okay, we need some real wise cultivation. And what's actually happening is just a regressive, shallow yammering and the, in, the, in the institutional infrastructure. And at the same time, individually, there's a lot of brilliant people and now there are these small movements that I really do see that actually 
I, my fantasy is that actually there is this potential. It hasn't been really seen yet, but not unlike the potential of Jordan Peterson, there is this potential. It's like, okay, we can, we can wake up. And if we seed it and some of the beauty of the technology like Zoom, there is a potential for huge amounts of face-to-face -face connection or at least digital face-to-face -face connection, right? Um, and maybe we can really turn a corner and basically be like, listen, we really need to start the process of seeking, emerging, reflecting on conscious evolution. That needs to become the cool things that kids do, <laughs> you know, um, and really need a, a process of cultivating the kinds of engagements and dialogues that you are talking about. And you saw in John, who then turned into Dialogos, like, yeah, Dialogos, that's a beautiful thing, you know, okay. um, but we got to spread that. Um, and it should be happening that a psychologist and a pastor should be able to come together and be like, hey, man, what do you think about God? You know, and that's yeah. cool. Like, yeah. that's not yeah. like a dangerous thing. That's like a really interesting it's okay that where I come from, where you come from. I mean, that's what, if we're going to manage this process, we're really actually going to manage diversity. We're going to realize how people are shaped by the paradigms of what I call justification systems that they live their lives by. And we have to figure out how to relate to each other's justification systems with, with health, um, with sophistication. Um, we, need to, we need a fundamental upgrade about our understanding of psychology. This is my fun. I talk about the problem of psychology. Uh, there is a way that we can do so much better than what I call the materialist flatland. You know, I get my own critique of, of Sam Harris and others. And, you know, it's like, there is a way to be very clear about what our soul needs um, from a scientific psychological perspective. And uh, that's a, you know, I wanna have conversations with that. And that, that if we understood that, that would change so much about the way we relate to people and think about jobs and wealth and um, what the kinds of transformations that would we would want to be moving towards the 21st century. You know, it's, it's interesting listening to you because I've got, you know, part of, I mean, a, I started my channel, you know, why did I even start my channel? I started my channel partly because I wanted, I wanted more and better conversation partners about some of the things that I had been wrestling with, even just within theology, church work, and you know the work I do, um, and and I got that and a lot more. It turned out, which again was totally <laughs> accidental. And I'm I'm glad, quite frankly, I I, I have more than I can handle right now. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I just listen to what you described, there's a part of my audience that's going to hear that and dismiss it as this, is, and then they'll have all kinds of different words that they use to dismiss it. Okay. Um, and good part of um, people who are not my audience <laughs> because <laughs> because that they would see they would say there's a Calvinist Christian minister from a moderate not a mainline mm -hmm. evangelicalish you know the, the the kind of as is not uncommon in churches usually the the college professors and the denominational bureaucrats are sort of mainline ish but the rank and file is much more evangelical that's kind of where the CRC is at and, you know, his solution, you had all these fancy words about evolution of consciousness and practices and, and then all the, all the Christians over here are just going to say, we just need Jesus. And, you know, and, and here we are. And, and so part of, you know, part of what I've, I've been working to try to do at least because I, I can't play in your ball field because I'm not a psychologist and I'm not an academic. I am a pastor. But a lot of what I try to do is listen carefully to what goes on here. And it was so interesting because when I first started talking to John Verveke, there was a fair amount of rumbling in certain parts of my mm. following. Is like, why are you talking to that guy? Okay. He yeah. talks about Buddhism. <clears throat> he does mm -hmm. meditation. Um, and you know, he's, you know, a lot of grumbling about yeah. John Verbeke yeah. after about a year or so, a lot of those people that have been grumbling to me eh, starting to pick up and well, you know, John, right. meh, 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 but he's okay. So, okay. John's right. okay with some of these people now. So I'd say, <laughs> okay, we've made progress. Um, but a big part of this for me is figuring out how, in fact, we can you know, again, to use the pandemic as an illustration, there's this there's this thing 
flooding over us, but it's a very slow moving thing. And I really loved how John and, and Christopher sort of laid out some of the 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 symptoms of the meaning crisis. We yes. see it in, you yeah, know, and I think John is beautifully articulate in how mm -hmm. this connects up to opioid addiction, let's say video right. da game addiction, uh, pornography, you know, a whole bunch of, and you as a clinician yeah. understand, you know, you, you talk to someone who's just, they're, they're just self-medicating in all of these different ways. Yep. And it's eating away at their capacities for real relationships and real intimacy and their ability mm -hmm. to actually live peacefully and productively with other people and you know all of this stuff and again as a pastor pa churches are sort of like the cvs layer of <laughs> fighting the pandemic we've got we've got little <laughs> shops all mm -hmm. over the place but gotcha. cvs is way more organized than okay. the church <laughs> because there's right. you know there's if, if CVS were in a state of perpetual grumbling war, but could at least agree under coalesce under the flag of pharmacy, you know, like the church right. coalesce under the flag of Jesus, <laughs> um, right. at least you got some commonality. But then, of course, we have the academy, we have therapists, you got these borderline therapists who are Christian therapists, and, you know, yep. both sides wonder about them. So it's kind of a mess out there. Oh, it's a huge mess. And, and but I, you know, what I saw immediately was that I, I can learn some things from John Verveke, and I can learn some things from you. And I, there's a lot I need to learn. And and so I can perhaps do a little bit of translating for the, for at least my tribe over here and say, okay. you know, let's, let's, let's see if we right. can make sense of this. And I don't know. And, and, I but, but that. again, the magnitude of this is, is breathtaking. And, it is. you know, it, and in terms, in terms of my work too, the failure of the church to, um, now, I, I have to be real careful with that because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sevilla <laughs> King was another person that we spoke with mm -hmm. and, and have spoken to. And Sevilla, in my conversation with her, noted that she was, she first went to art school and then she was trained mm -hmm. as a psychologist. And then she was working mm -hmm. in like, a I don't know, community clinic or something and began right. to understand, hey, wait a minute. Psychologists are becoming aware that churches and religion actually have a huge role in <laughs> keeping marriages together and pe keeping people from, you know, falling off into alcoholism. Yeah. And, you know, churches are actually have this enormous stabilizing. Um, totally. Well even, documented that well-being and church right. commitment is, uh, you know, that's not an artifact. That is and, a real and, thing. It, and it seems to me that that the academy is, is at least part, some people in the academy are at least aware of this and not quite as hostile as one might imagine if you listen to Sam Harris. Totally, this is, and this is, the, this is the dynamic, Paul. I mean, in terms of, but there is a lot of hostility. I mean, let's face it, on both sides of this yep. fence, yep. you know? And I'm trying to move, uh, so there's some, there is this sort of sensibility that I'm a part of, which is like, hey, we have our systems of justification, okay? And they're really important to us, all right? A, a system of justification is a network of propositions, about through language about what is and ought and they give our lives certain meaning okay and and we make sense out of the world through them okay uh and we need to honor them absolutely we need to be grounded in them but i will argue and and you you know your listeners may vary depending on how they much want to hear this that that we need to be also rooted in our justifications but also cosmopolitan in relation to other justifications okay uh, that means we need to be able to step outside our, ours and empathize with others uh, and not immediately cling to ours as the only justified version of reality that is true, okay, but actually be pluralistic some in relationship to this uh, and then be open to the idea of, yeah, maybe there is some ultimate kind of truth, you know, maybe I kind of am open to that, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't know that anybody got it. You know, I mean, you know, with a huge amount of clear, undisputable specificity, I'm not seeing that, you know. Uh, so the question is, can we figure out a way to relate to each other with all these different commitments and belief systems, justification systems, 
and and can we kind of come together and uh, you know, like I said, create a wisdom comments like, hey, I want to learn from you. I want to wonder, you have a lot of wisdom, clearly. I mean, I've listened to you. I know you do. We might not share the exact same ontology of the world. Okay. So, you know, so, oh, so. <laughs> I mean, it was like, that's it. we can just say so, hug each other and be like, all right, hey, I, I still want to learn from you. That's what my hope is. And if we can stay rooted and, and figure out a way to hold what we hold dear to us and at the same time respect where other justification systems operate. I believe that that's a, the, and, and, and network them together and not see them as competing. So you have either Sam Harris and Christianity is just a bunch of lies. Right. <laughs> no, that's kind of complicated, yeah. right? You know, um, and, or science is bust bunk and there is no such thing as evolution. It's like, no, that's kind of complicated too. Meanwhile, the lights go off in Texas. It's like, man, eh, yeah. <laughs> what a little science and technology when the polar vortex comes down and, you know, freezes, freezes Texas. So, well, well, and that's, and that's good. And, you know, maybe, maybe we can get into some of these things then because, you know, I like the way, you know, your systems of justification because, but also recognizing everyone needs a system of justification. You can't Absolutely. live without one. And in this world now, I, I also think it's the case that it's probably true that all systems of justification also need in some ways competitors uh -oh, because I think that's sort of how we, that's how they get, that's how they evolve. By the way, they define right. themselves against others and then they position themselves into this space in this, this landscape of justification. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting, you know, I often talk about in, in my theological tradition, the kind of the some of the lights that um in our particular theological tradition in the dutch calvinist i think about abram kuyper and and um herman bovink mm. they one of the things that abram kuyper noted was he was both a theologian of the antithesis which mm. is sort of binary on off black white right wrong heaven hell but right. also common grace because you you actually need both of those things to 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 really function in the world, which is interesting. And I think that's sort of analogous to you need a system of justification that you that you comfortably, securely, I would say even in a strange way, naively inhabit. You need yes. to have a system of justification that you see the world, that you, you see through in order to understand the world. You so, must have that. Yeah. You cannot live without one of those. Yet, you are also going to have to, because these things, you know, it's not like here's Christianity, here's science. I mean, those are big ones, but of course they scale down and they fractal all the way down that my Christianity and my colleague's Christianity and his church next door you know, there may be huge degrees of commonality, but when we start getting into those details, a so, lot of difference. Yeah. yeah. So you have all of these systems. And so the, actually these, these systems have to figure out, they must compete with each other, yeah. but we want them to do so productively. Amen. And yeah. without bloodshed, preferably. Right. And, right. and probably, you know, and, and whereas you know, another thing that so Abram Kuyper also became not only was he a theologian who founded a basically a theological school, both literally and figuratively and split a church, but he also mm -hmm. became prime minister of the Netherlands. So he was oh, wow. it was it was quite a polymath. <laughs> I guess so. And he um, and then he started pillarization in the Netherlands, which was an attempt to what he taught, what he tried to get at, which was principled pluralism, which is often what it's called. And nice. it's against, it's, a, it's an attempt to integrate, you know, the fact that you're always going to have antithesis, right and wrong. Yep. My system of justification is right. Yours is wrong. Okay. You got to have that. But at the same time, you also need common grace that there's some, there's some rough edges to my system that I've, I don't really kind of fully am comfortable with. And every now and then I look at theirs and say, you kind of do that a little better than me. Beautiful. And, and at the same time, because, because of the right and wrong, I can be secure in mine and say, Hey, 
this is my system. This is my tribe. This is my people. This is my religion. I'll be here till I die. But you know that Verveki guy, his non-theism, his religion, his dialogo stuff. I, I, you know, I can, I, I'm going to borrow some of those things probably right. and try to integrate them into my system, which I love. So I don't know if, I don't that's know if- beautiful. Yeah, no, that's exactly, this is exactly the kind of architectural reflection on our structure and our relation that I hope we do. So as brilliant as that. Um, I'll add a couple of pieces. So, um, so here's, you say we have one, but I'll just invite people. You'll notice that you go through different modes <laughs> as mm -hmm. one person, right? You're know, like, sometimes, oh my God, I have the most faith in the world. And other times like, eh, I'm kind of doubting it, right? Okay. Uh, so certainly I'll say that as a scientist, I believe certain things. And now all of a sudden, I don't know, I don't know. Um, my brother just discovered aliens in Tic Tac. And now he's like, I think they're probably aliens out there. You know, it's like, so this world is, you know, changing and he's encouraging us. So these things do are crucial, but they evolve. Uh, they do sit on our heart in a particular way and our heart will shift so that they emphasize different aspects of them. So we can see it in ourselves that there's variation, even as we hold to ours. You, you mentioned principal pluralism. I love that. All right. In fact, the uh, the mindset I advocate for is an integrated pluralism, okay? which probably would be similar, perhaps. Um, and I would say part of the integration comes in what I call the concept of meta values. Okay. Meta values are sort of like, hey, are there things that we, irrespective or universally through our systems of justification, can we say are these sort of universal moral values? Okay. Uh, and universal moral values is a great way to create common ground. It's like, oh, okay, you know, we're okay. Um, so my study of moral values, I identify three meta moral universal values through my, because, and this is through this process is sort of like, okay, not the content of belief, but what is ought to be, or what are valued states of being, or what are the things that are sacred? Um, and so I have a saying that says, be that which enhances dignity and well-being with integrity. And so, and what those are for me, uh, those are my three big moral meta values, as it were. Uh, dignity, well-being, and integrity. It's, and, it's, it's very, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's look at those a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you look at, say, Jonathan Haidt's work. Yes. It's, course. it's, you know, because height, you know, and of course his observations, I mean, they come at a time and I, my undergrad degree is in history. And so one of the things you learn in history is that if someone writes a history in the 1980s about the 17th century, that history is going to be dealing with the issues in the 1980s, um, totally. as well as the 17th century, hopefully. My, my history professor father will confirm that. That's right. That's, that's, that's <laughs> part history's of History is always changing, as he would say. That's, that's right. right. It's always changing. Um, now, dignity is a is a very. I mean, they're they're all they're all you know. In, in, well, why don't you why don't you talk about each of them a little bit? Sure, absolutely. And, and, and I want to say that I, I just invite people to wonder if to develop two or three male you know, love and agape. There are a lot of different beautiful potential yep. values. Yep. Okay? Yep. Here's yep. how I got to mine. So I'm sort of, I'm this cosmopolitan globalist at some level, like I'm sort of like I'm trying to, so that's where I am. So I'm not going to be anchored into a particular, uh, you know, religious tradition per se, but that's where I am. And then as I look at it, it's sort of, so the most consensual document that has ever been signed is the United Declaration of Human Rights. Okay. In 1948, uh, the United Nations got together, not so, you know, think of that time, that's right after the World War II, okay? And they saw the horrors of World War II, most notably the Nazi camps, but obviously there were other horrors going on too. Um, and they were like, this was bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it didn't have to be too bad. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, 19, the 1940s up until now, not Back. good. <laughs> you know, yeah, I and mean, we can laugh about it, but it actually makes a deep point. Yes. Really, you know, makes a deep point. So then they were like, they, then people got together and they like, well, you know, somehow we have to try to create a system that protects people universally. And then what to across all these systems of justification, all these national and religious ideas then that came together, 
and started to ask, well, how do we do that? Well, virtually all of them had nation state laws that served in that, that would then say, well, you can't do this and can't do that. Well, what justifies law? Well, what fun, everyone, and people differed why this was the case, but the fundamental justification for enactment of justice and law was the idea that people had dignity, that you conferred, and this is almost cyclical, cyclical in the yeah. sense that you're like, well, we're going to value them so they have value, so then we create values to protect them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> okay, yeah, and value to be honored, respected, and dignified, okay, to be treated and you know, as a fundamental entity that does, that warrants that. And I call, and I then differentiate this in two different levels. So one is fundamental dignity, okay? I believe we should confer to all human beings fundamental dignity. And, you know, you get into things like, well, it's just a proportion and euthanasia quickly become a parent. It's like, yep, that's right. <laughs> it's complicated, um, but there are good reasons. And in fact, the law essentially as a mechanism of justification requires this, we need, Okay. Um, and as a human being, I will tell you that one of, if you know anything about like Carl Maslow, I mean, Carl Maslow, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, um, like belonging and esteem, which basically can be reduced to the sense of felt dignity. Do you treat me with dignity? Do I treat myself with dignity, belonging and respect, honor? This is a core issue that we track. Okay. Um, so it's a fundamental to our souls is to be treated with dignity. And you will see if people feel disrespected, dishonored, and indignant <laughs> done across the human condition. That's not, that's not good. <laughs> and people but bitter and, and it goes with all sorts of problems. Um, so there's this fundamental dignity and then incremental dignity. So incremental dignity is, hey, did you live your best life today in terms of your values and virtues? You know, did you steal? Uh, did you, you know, sin? <laughs> Whatever your kind of system is, it's sort of like, how do you then evaluate actions, uh, slices of human condition? and make dignified or, or their, the opposite judgment, okay? So that's incremental dignity. And, and so this fundamentally is the first and, and really the foundation. And basically, like I said, it's about valuing the human condition in, in its totality and fundamentally at first, and then how do you value it incrementally in relationship um, to really the fundamental aesthetics of being. Okay. So then the second one is well-being. Uh, if you know Sam Harris, you know he did the moral landscape, okay? The moral landscape, Harris said, well, science is, you know, has some problems, but if we, if we value what well-being is, then we can justify that science really fundamentally is about increasing well-being. And I was like, oh. so why aren't we on a religious, Sam? Most people, <laughs> so religion got value increases well-being. Yeah, know, Peterson, Peterson to says to Harris, <laughs> that well-being, that's, that's a non-starter. You can't yeah. start there, but keep going. So, so anyway, I... I found that to be fascinating and I'm interested in that. And in fact, one of the, I have sort of have seven, eight different ideas. You know, one of them is actually, there's just a way to define what well-being is. Okay. There, there really is a way to define it, especially you use the system I bring. It's, pretty, it's actually not as complicated as people make it, but it all depends. That's often is the case is how, does you look, how do you look at it? Right. Um, so I developed this thing called the nested model of well-being, which specifies the elements that go into well-being um, and how to align them. And I will say one of the elements that go into well-being is the values of the evaluator. Um, so the evaluator will make a judgment as to what is good and bad. That's part of what the concept of well-being is. Um, but there are other well-specified elements to it that you can delineate. And of course, you know, if you work as a doctor or a psychological doctor like I do, or as a pastor, you see suffering. You know what suffering is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you try to position yourself to eliminate suffering, yep. alle not eliminate, alleviate, yep. and move people towards uh, happier, healthier states of fulfillment in, yeah. in a nutshell. Okay. But you also you also try, and as a as a clinician, you do this too. You also try to. You also not only tolerate, but you also use suffering in your of clients. Uh -huh. I mean, you don't. I mean, we have all this. You don't. You're not always simply re, you know alleviating suffering in your clients, and so uh, it, that's yeah, that's why you know well being is not synonymous with non suffering. That's hundred percent true. It's not synonymous with happiness in the shallow sense either. Yeah, that's definitely not true. Uh, yeah. And and certainly it's a big difference between just being happy. Uh, and and people actually, you, you'll get a sense of this. In fact, they studied this. They asked people if you could take a happy pill, just take a pill and be happy for the rest of your life. Right. You know, and then would people do that? And they're no, I wouldn't want to do that. Most people would say no. 
true. I mean, at least. But they'd certainly like it available at certain times. They would like it, and believe me, they use them. (laughs) They certainly do. (laughs) And, of course, if you're miserable, if you're really boxed into a corner, you're in a state of depression, chronic pain, it becomes a lot easier to escape, okay? Right. But I'm I'm just saying that people's sense of what real well-being is, is not just drug-induced happiness. I mean, people have a deeper, deeper, richer sense, and they're right about that in my estimation. I think you can make that argument academically and, and specify what that is. So, so living your best life with fulfillment and richness. Um, uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant's a famous philosopher who talked about uh, this in terms of happiness with the worthiness to be happy. Okay, that's how basically he, uh, that's his one sentence definition of well-being and that actually connects uh, to the way I would frame it as well. So it's really, it is this reflective wise worldview analysis of is it a rich meaningful life really and happy is it happiness coupled with that um and and aristotle talked about what's called eudaimonia which is a greek word but that's basically a very similar way of thinking about it. it's happiness with reaching your virtuous potential and and to make a positive difference in the world um, so those are different angles on the concept of well-being and and I think if you think about yourself, what you do to yourself, what you do to others, um, that you move in a way or would be liking to be moving in a way to enhance well-being as a reasonable, virtuous, uh, wise alignment. So how about integrity? We, t- we talked about... Uh... Yeah. So integrity basically means honor, soundness, coherence, and honesty. Uh, it means being attempting to be truthful uh, and clear uh, with what's going on. So you can envision a situation where you you know, have dignity and you feel happy, but you also have, you know, lied to yourself about stuff, okay? And that would press against integrity some. You know? So the value of integrity would be, well, <laughs> you know, you definitely have to ask hard questions and seek truth. They kind of align with the big three concepts of truth and integrity, goodness and well-being and beauty and dignity. Uh, so that has the big three values can be actually corresponded somewhat along those lines. Uh, and again, my basic invitation is I don't think there's any, you know, real ultimate, you know, calculus of these moral, ultimate moral values. But what I do think is when you look at the great wisdom traditions, you see a huge amount of overlap, you know, uh, and, and so the integrated pluralism or principled pluralism of these big meta values. Yep. And if we all plug into that, that's going to get us a huge amount towards coordinating connection and, and being felt like we're all a we space together, even as we have our very important differences. Now, to to put on my Calvinist, Augustinian, uh, even Pauline cap here, the mm-hmm. to 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 dip into the narrative of Israel, the, mm-hmm. the challenge of Israel in the Old Testament was not that she didn't know the law. And I would mm-hmm. say that the challenge for us is not that if you would say if you would say dignity, well-being, integrity to just about anybody out there, they're going to say, yeah, that's, yep. it's, it's not a question that we don't know the good, or at least we don't know a good enough that's yep. out there. It's the question that we can't do it. <laughs> that's, <Yes. and> that's, <laughs> That's my theological that's, tradition. No, no. There's a there's a deep skepticism about that. And part of what was interesting about Peterson was that he was, I think, in terms of to add some theological categories, and I hope the so the soteriology, the salvation strategy for Peterson mm-hmm. was fairly stoic, yes. in my opinion. Yep. But that. his anthropology was quite Augustinian in mm-hmm. that he okay. had a and I think you get that as a clinician. Yep. If you're sitting in, a, I, I have a, I have a marriage and family therapist in my church, and I often look at her and say, "I don't think I could do what you do because <laughs> sit in that little room, eight hours a day, in the weeds with people. You know, by the time someone's ready to pay someone a bit of money to talk for one or two times a week to a total stranger." They're pretty deep in the weeds. They're in the weeds, <laughs> and yeah. it's not going to be real easy to get them out. Uh, no, it's a. I actually love marriage counseling, but you're right; it's unbelievably intense and 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 you know stressful, definitely, and, and not easy. So, so, uh, so you know, you've got some high ideals here, and the, really, the question is, okay, I think we all can. I think 
I, I think Christians can look at those three words and many Christians would say, yeah, that's, you know, Tom Holland's, he would mm -hmm. say that's, that's sort of Christianity light right there. And we get a lot of those values and, and CS Lewis pointed out at the end of the abolition of man, he called it the Tao because he said, you find these commonalities far beyond Christianity. You find them pretty much throughout the world and you can construct yep. sort of a natural law thinking to it, but getting people there, there's right. the, yeah, know, it's, the, it's the God right. himself, you know, <laughs> got so frustrated with the problem that he called in the Babylon, the Babylonians to destroy the <laughs> temple. Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, here's my point. Okay. Well, I mean, there's multiple points to make, but like, well, first off, it took me a long time to actually arrive at those three, mm. okay? So yeah, they're both common sense. And why did I have to go so deep and actually come back and basically be like, hey, after years of study as a clinical psychologist, which means I'm asking deep questions about value, I'm wondering about how people are, I want people to get along, I come back and I'm basically rediscovering what many people will say, well, I'm, you know, that's kind of common sense, who won't agree with that, okay? It's like, but why? <laughs> Fair enough, but I'm not like saying two plus two. Yes, it's common sense, but I'm actually sort of saying, here's a new, like it should be more conscious to us than this, meaning yeah. that it should already be in our head that we carry this kind of thing around. What happened so that it, we forgot that this was common sense? And if we remind ourselves that this was, if we re-remember, to use some of John's, you know, rediscover yep. what's inside of us already in relationship to that, that's what actually part of what I'm calling is basically I'm like, there's actually a wisdom inside of us. There's wisdom inside of our natures and in our civilizations, and we can upgrade them. And believe me, if we actually upgrade them and put them face and center, Twitter wars look, look different. You know, the, the, the system starts to look very different in terms of how we relate. If I related to you on first principles of dignity, well-being, and integrity, and I look at you and I say, oh my gosh, Paul, you do almost everything what I try to do. I try to relate to people. I connect with their suffering. I bring them together. You know, okay, we have different ontological commitments. You know, but if we core at the values issue and we put that front and center, I mean, that's a big difference in relating. So that's yep. what I would suggest in relationship to, um, yeah, it's definitely hard, but we don't do it very well at all now. I mean, we know we've forgotten it. I don't know what happened, but <laughs> whether we ever did, but we certainly could do it better in sort of making this a point that we all socialize our kids around, you know, and, and yep. figure out ways to, to cultivate and be guided by. Well, and part of the struggle here is as a pastor, it could be very convenient and many pastors do it of, you know, lamenting and haranguing and, uh, you know, browbeating their congregation to perform better with respect to what they all said they wanted to do. But the pastor himself has to look in the mirror and say, "Why am I? Why aren't I better than this?" And gets to, you know, gets to Romans seven, where the apostle Paul says, "The good, you know, the good I would do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do." We are not masters of our own home, and yeah, you know, it, and to me, this is, you know, whereas I think Peterson tapped into. You know, there's a certain sense in which Jordan, and it's been interesting, some of those who've kind of followed him, like Dave Rubin, when I listen to him, I'm old enough, so I'm about, I'm, Jordan is just one year older than me. And when mm -hmm. I listen to Jordan, sometimes I, I'm transported back into the 70s yeah. and into the, and into the Cold War. And I hear, sure. you know, Dave Rubin for a younger guy has sort of now really mimicked a cold warrior. And I hear him, you know, say all of these things from the cold war. And it's like, yeah, I've, I've heard all this before. Yeah. And, um, but the, the, and this is, this is always the challenge of say the Christian box where mm -hmm. one, by the time you actually take the steps to become a member of a church, you know, let's, you know, there's the doctrinal stuff and all that, but mm -hmm. you get it all the way boiled down and it's like, okay, Jesus is God and you want to be like him. I mean, they're, right. they're, you know, what would Jesus do? A little wristband right. sure. broadly across and everybody fails dramatically at it. 
<laughs> well, he sets a pretty high bar. <laughs> yeah, it is a high bar. Well, you want the, you know, the, the bat to Jordan Peterson. You want that bar high. You, need you want to carry high. that heavy cross, <laughs> drag right, it up that hill. Drag the rock up there or the cross up the hill. Totally. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that, that to me is, um, you know, is again, the, the continual challenge of, and, and now obviously in churches, you have practices and traditions and all of this in order to pursue it outside of church, you have other things. Um, and, and when we when it comes to, you know, we we a little while ago we were talking about you know institutionalizing, and just a couple of days ago I had a really excellent talk with a uh, a Roman Catholic theologian and a um, a Roman Catholic layperson. Well, they're both laypersons. A theologian mm -hmm. isn't isn't ordained, but um, you know, and and just struggling with the, you know, especially for a Roman Catholic that unlike a Protestant, so much freight is carried by the integrity of the institution. And then to have the kinds of, you know, the kinds of priest sexual scandals they have had is just devastating to their whole system of how the world can be saved. Yeah. And, and so, you know, every, not only does every system have its, its, um, uh, I got to grab your language here. Your uh, justification. Uh, how did you say it? Um, their system of justification. Your system of justification. System. But every uh, system also has to have their their system of salvation, which actually Christian you can sort of work that out because justification is such a yeah. big word in terms of especially Protestant theology. But so yeah, I know. <laughs> so what's so the the dominant modern and this is sort of where we're in Sam Harris land, the dominant modern system of salvation, the soteriology for, for modernity has tended to be technique, you know? Um, and, and I yep. think in some ways that's a reaction to Christendom's, you know, yep. beliefism that was yep. so dominant in Protestantism, especially. So, so where, where do you see this going? Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, so here's where I am and, and I met them in this sort of, you know, me and John are in very, so if, so if you're, if your audience wants to know what I believe, it's very similar to what John Bravicki is. So that's where my basic structure is. Okay. Um, and what I am trying to look at is this sort of scientific humanistic theologian view, okay, of, of what would be a global way of being and a rooted way of being simultaneously. So that's what I'm wondering. I believe we need both as humans and I'm wondering about that, okay? So and when I look out at the landscape, so based on my sort of new world view, which sort of is this new scientific, broad, but spiritual kind of worldview um, that tracks the evolution of cultural consciousness, okay? Track the evolution of cultural consciousness uh, uh, and across four different sensibilities. I, I identify four different sensibilities broadly that I think are useful for, uh, and I want to then create or, or invite us to see if we could build a way of being that integrates these four different sensibilities or, and honors them effectively. Okay. So the first sensibility is the oral indigenous sensibility. Okay. So this is before we had civilization where we hung together around a fire and talked and didn't have writing and everything was face-to-face -face, in family, in nature, uh, in a very close-knit group, okay? Uh, and we know uh, from studies, anthropological studies, you can look and you can see there's a particular kind of sensibility that oral indigenous hunter-gatherer populations have about the world, about each other, okay? Uh, of course, some of them, because they're grounded in the tech, they don't have massive technologies, they don't have lots of things. Some of them, you can, we have a tendency, I think, sometimes look and say, oh, that's really simplistic or primitive or, uh, you know, problematic. And that's one angle. And another angle, I believe, wow, we're, they're actually, they reflect a lot of what our nature is. <laughs> and they harmonize with each other in the world in a particular kind of way that we can learn a lot from. And I think many of our mo modern ills are because we've gotten away from some of those lifestyles that we need to re-remember those, okay? So that's one sensibility. 
A second sensibility is the traditional um, civilized sensibility, okay? Which is basically the identity of a nation and a religion. All right, and this happens about 5,000 years ago. We get, you get writing, you get agriculture, you get civilization basically. And then we get these nation states that are organized around, you can't do it by a tribe. You actually have to have writing, you have to have rules, you have to have authority, you have experts. And then you get these formal, traditional formal worldviews, these, these justification systems that bring civilizations together with an identity, uh, a description of what is in, in terms of the cosmos and what ought to be. And you know, how do we live? What do men do? What do women do? What's the proper way of being in the world? And of course, the Judeo-Christian version of reality is one of the beautiful, great wisdom traditions. And for what, a thousand years in Europe? It, it's the only one. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. that's basically it, right? Yeah. Um, and, and everybody, 99% of the people, a couple of Jews, no atheists for a thousand years, right? I know. Uh, and then about at the 15th century mark, okay, uh, Copernicus into Galileo, in Europe, you see the emergence of a different kind of, in fact, it was actually the church's confidence that they could, in truth, and then that they could do natural philosophy, that they set the scientists yep. out, yep. and they said, hey, there's got to be ways in which God's law works, right? Yep. And, and that would, God's, you know, doing his thing, and he does his miracles, but a lot of the universe just works like clockwork. Natural philosophers, you go out there and figure this out, you know? Um, well, and again, I would, to, 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 put, to put in my God number one, God number two thing, I think this is actually part of what happened with Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris was that when when the church was doing that natural philosophy, as we would call it, they yeah. were seeking God number one. I mean, that okay. was, I mean, it was God who was doing this. And then of course, deism mm -hmm. and then God separates and then we're sort of only left with God number two. Mm -hmm. And, but if you read again, older texts, you know, when you, or you read the Bible, um, you have this, you know, well, this happened. So of course, God must have done it. Okay, what do you mean by God? But anyway, go ahead. Well, that's, I mean, that's a beautiful point, because really, as I think you'll agree, the real ontology of God is not an easy question to answer. That's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's very right. Well, call me if you get a clear answer to the ontology <laughs> of God. But last I checked, it's confusing. Yes. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so we can, so we can then say, though, that then what happens is, is that their modernity really gets science and the philosophy and capitalism and the industrial labor thing that happens in the 17th into 18th and then really 19th centuries, okay? And then explodes out of European colonialism and then changes the world with the modern capital liberal democratic way of thinking, okay? And that's modernity. So that's the third. And modernity has a lot of value and a lot of interesting ways of thinking, okay? Um, and we can go through some of them, but it has a certain kind of sensibility. But obviously in our tradition, Europe into America, we have a huge conflict now between what emerges through some of the key insights of scientists, science from modernity, like Newton, matter and motion, and then Darwin and evolution, right? Versus whatever ontological God claims Christians are making. It's a classic, but what do we do with this? These are two different yep. worldviews, right? Um, and in terms of implementation, really, modernity ends up pushing the church back, right? Yep. And at least relative to where it was uh, in Europe, okay? And then modernity spreads everywhere. Uh, and then people like Nietzsche uh, say, oh, God, this is, oh, God, no pun intended. God's dead. <laughs> We're in trouble, <laughs> okay? And, and bad things are going to happen because we don't, uh, you know, there's a good critique analytically, but our, what humans need to make values is this is going to be bad news when we try to rediscover our values. And lo and behold, we get the world wars, right? Um, and we try to coalesce, but I would argue then what happens fundamentally is, is that in the last 50 years, uh, you see the postmodern critique of modernism, okay, uh, which is like, yeah, the white colonialism and the dogmatism of science versus the dogmatism. And, and then you bring this whole critique of, no, there is no grand scientific narrative. There's a lot of danger of white male European colonialization. There's all these questions. Hey, it's, you know, it's not, now it's not Christianity that gets knocked off. It's any scientific dogmatism that gets knocked off and critiqued, okay? And now we're just left with, well, <laughs> so what is it? It's like, well, you're just wherever, you know? Um, and you have like the internet and digital and 
because now you have all of this potential. Okay. So we're at a, when, when John sees the meaning crisis, at least with me, I, when, you know, what I learned about from him, it's like, of course, this is what I, people have no idea what their system of justification is. It's just chaotic. And I mean, they're cling to various elements. Okay. So my argument is this, um, it gets back to, there's a, if there's, is there a stance we can relate to our systems of justification? Okay. Is there a way in which we can step, we can feel them and know we need them. And at the same time, we can step outside of it. Okay. That's one stance. I believe that that will help us. And maybe that whole principal pluralism that <laughs> I forget the, the Dutch was it the Abram Dutch Kuyper. Abram Kuyper. Sorry, I don't know my history there. That's but, okay. Um, that is, <laughs> the Netherlands is a small country, and there's just a few of us that, you know, Abram Kuyper, Herman Bobbing, right. just <laughs> Calvin College, and a few of those strange people. All right. Well, fair enough. Right. I don't, I don't know that history, but anyway, I can relate to it. That's the point is that if you can empathize, if we have the right relation to these things, we can empathize with life and usually extract wisdom. So here's my bo bottom line is, is that I believe that if we get the right frame on this, we can extract the wisdom from the oral indigenous traditions. And really something like Zoom may really help us with that. Look at this conversation, right? We, we can actually talk to each other, see each other quasi face to face, <laughs> connect across time and then feel relationally connected. All right, so then there's the traditional um, mode of operating. There are, there are these wisdom traditions that merge out of the axial age. That's a technical term for when like Buddhism and Hinduism and Judeo-Christian lines emerge. These things have been around forever. They have, you know, in my estimation, there's a lot. This is why I like the Bible series. There's a lot to learn from them. Um, I say this as somebody who was raised in a Dawkins-esque atheist house. And in retrospect, I'm like, dad, you overshot on both accounts. <laughs> okay. You know, like you, know, you went from evangelical on the one hand, and then you compensated. I know about psychology, you compensate. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it's like, actually there's a, there's a really way to connect here. <laughs> That's hilarious. And, uh, um, and then there is the postmodern critique that, yep. that at a justice level that warrants uh, for us to, you know, so the modernist that you get reason and science is crucial. We do, technology's happened. It's already here. Uh, a lot of good liberal demo, democratic ideals that happen. And, and you can take those four sensibilities and basically be like, hey, might it make sense for us to be able to have an integrated pluralistic way of grounding ourselves that appreciates across uh, each of those? Uh, ways it's a tall order that's you know oh, that's, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's you know for i mean john and i we, we've talked about this and and it's a it's a tall order because and because what what i see working in it, it's funny because people see me on youtube and they listen to my monologues and they look at my conversations with people like you and if they, and then every now and then someone comes through Sacramento and they come into the church, they kind of look around. It's like, I was expecting, you know, whiz bang, cutting edge, you know, whatever they were expecting. And they come in and it's just like, well, it, you know, they talk about the Bible and they've got like these women's Bible studies. And mm -hmm. when I listen to these people, it's all, you know, it's, it, it looks, it looks frightfully like that that nasty little church in my neighborhood that, you know, mm. <laughs> that I would sure. never want to go to. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, but yet I, I am still the pastor here and I do inhabit this because part of what I see, even with all of this is, is that, um, you know, having a, a, we had a, we have men's Bible study on Wednesday night on zoom now. And, you know, just listening to the people talk, these old, um, these old systems and structures still work very well for them. Mm -hmm. totally. And, you know, one of the things that people often don't realize about church is just what a mess they are theologically, especially mm -hmm. in a diverse context like mine, where many Christian Reformed Church, they'd be made up mostly of people who have been at least to a degree, catechized generationally. And so you actually have a semi-coherent agreement with respect to theology. A uh, church like mine, it's a mess. And, and you know, I most people don't 
most of my church members don't watch my, not, hardly any of my church members watch my videos. Um, <laughs> then maybe that's how I get to keep my job. No, that's not true. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really, it's really difficult for me to imagine that the, let me say it this way. The most successful transitions that the world has made have have usually ridden the backs of religious movements. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not even true because you know it, it, the world is just so big; it's just really hard to get a handle on everything. Because I can say something like that, and via one, let's say, window of relevance realization, we can say, "Oh, yeah," and then we track religious you know, these religious yeah, aspects sure. of movements. But then when we see things like what social media and the iPhone, how, how that in the last, you know, 12 years, 13 years has yep. remade our landscapes dramatically. Totally. Um, and so technology has that. Technology is clearly, I mean, I think, you know, to me, you know, there are these different, I mean, oral indigenous did a thing for a while and we had all these different ways of organizing civilization which brought its own technology fusion. I mean, civilization yep. is, a, is a technology fusion. Obviously science and technology did its thing. We, we, there's all sorts of different ways in which society changes. And I also just wanna hear your point. I mean, and this is, to me, this is one of the real, I don't know if a challenge is the right word, but I mean, conservatism exists for a very good reason. I mean, things work for a long time because they work for a long time. You get some progressive eye in the pie you know, sky ideals. And it's like, actually, you're missing a lot of bad consequences, externalities that those ideas you not can't see. So, and so there's a lot of wisdom in tradition. And at the same time, the world's changing really, really fast. Yeah, yeah. So I do believe that, that if we could have some sort of wisdom awakening or revival, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and that that could potentially catch fire, I actually see a longing for it. I really yeah. do. I really see a longing for it. Yeah. Um, and to me, if people could figure out a way to hold on to what's dear to them, oh, I know this and I found Jesus and this is key or I found signs, whatever. Yeah. It's like, there are ways I think you can hold on and honor your perspective and what you know from your subjective experience of being. Yep. And with a little training, there's also ways to empathize and relate. Yep. And if we relate to our justification systems in the right way, rather than like living through them and then forcing everything into them and positioning ourselves like, well, we're going to have control to see the truth and everybody that's against me is, you know, bad, yep. Yep. you know, it's like, well, actually, maybe there's a different way. And I think globally, we're going to need to learn a different way Then, uh, you know, that would be a, a, a better, smoother transition, perhaps, than yeah. what with the alternative. Might be. Yeah, because if you if you look through history. I mean, I mean, we, we, I, I suspect, well, and these transitions are long because if you look at say 1517 to the 1560s and so Luther Wittenberg, you know, 1517, John Calvin finishes his, his, um, his institutes in 1560s, you know, there, there's 50 years. But we've, you know, we're in a transition. The 60s was a tumultuous sea change in our culture. Um, the, you know, what the dislocation that happens in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, I mean, there's wars, there's, I mean, the French Revolution. Human beings don't do transitions easily. <laughs> no, absolutely not. You know, this, and, so, we're, and we're right. It, I mean, for me, I'll just say is that I think we're in just an unprecedented time. We definitely yeah. want to look at history, yep. um, but we we have created a system that we have yeah. never found ourselves in before, yeah. and that's going to make with predicting what's happening. Mm. Uh, I think that, you know, I feel some ang serious anxiety about the state of affairs. Yep. I see basically in, in a Jordan Peterson reference, I'll say, on earth, I see hell and heaven before us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like you know i i want i think to use john stanmore than a kairos of a moment means like what we do now has big impact and you know i would hope maybe we can feel the calling to be like hey how can i be a good ancestor live my best life what do we need to do to you know transform uh and that's what if i hope that that sensibility healthy transformation without sort of defensive reactivity that's a tall order 
yep. but we'll see. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Well, I, I've pestered you for an hour and 45 minutes. I want to give you a chance if there's anything you wanted to ask coming into this thing. Um, um, well, my, yeah, and, and certainly we can, you know, wrap up. I really enjoyed the conversation. I basically, I did want to hear from your own narrative. What were you as a Calvinist <laughs> pastor go pestering John? And what were you finding uh, in relationship to him? You already sort of answered that, but I, I would like to hear maybe... Uh, a little bit more elaboration on what you saw there, what drew you um, to him and what value you've gotten out of him. Well, I think, um, well, I, I, I live and work in, in Sacramento and Northern California has long been a place of religious experimentation for people. Mm -hmm. I have watched as a pastor um, people sort of throw down their Christian toys and walk out of the room. I've watched a lot of that. Okay. And then I tend to watch them pick up, they'll pick up meditation, they'll pick up yoga, they'll pick up martial arts, they'll pick up, they'll pick up a lot of these things that are, are sort of in John's community. Mm -hmm. And then I continue to watch them. And I, I think about it in terms of you know, I could see I could see some people leaving the church and picking up some of those things, and you know, say reading a, a really excellent book on trauma, the body keeps the score. Oh, I can sure. I can see some of these practices helping people, and again, as a as a Christian minister, I um, you know I'm, I'm not going to if you if you if you work in a community like I do. Many of the people that you help, and I, you know, I learned this from my father, who also was a Christian minister. Mm. You, you will help people far beyond those who will take you up and be interested in your religious ideas, positions, or practices. Mm. And I am totally good with that. When mm -hmm. someone comes into my church and they're working on something, uh, maybe they're church shopping, even a church shopper coming into my church, I would love to say, oh, this is the church for you. Sometimes nine times out of 10, I listen to them enough and it's like, you're probably going to find more of what you're looking for in a different church than this one, right. because every church has its own history and its particularity and strengths and weaknesses on different things. So gotcha. I'm, I'm very comfortable helping people beyond just trying to enfold them into my flock. Right. Okay. Uh, at the same time, um, I've, I've got some, you know, I've got some skepticism about uh, the capacity to make a religion that's not a religion. Oh, I, sure. in terms of competition, it's like, well, these religions have hundreds or thousands of years of, you know, <laughs> of stuff that they've already sort of digested into their system and continue to build, even as they're adapting to modern situations. And so, Boy, John, that's I I, I, I wouldn't want to start from scratch. I, I appreciate the I appreciate the blank sheet effort to try and construct something and borrow from things, but oh gosh, it's it's analogous to Jordan Peterson saying, you don't just sit down and write a fairy tale. And when someone like Tolkien does what he did, or J.K. Rowling's or or even mm -hmm. you know George Lucas, mm. number one, they're always building on the back of someone else. But number yeah. two, we also don't know how long that thing is going to last. And sure. whereas to, to look at someone like, say, Nassim Talib, who makes the point that if you, you know, so he's he's into, you know, he's a he's a Wall Street guy. Yeah. You know who mm -hmm. Nassim Talib is? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he says, if you really want to look for something durable, look for something really old. Now, that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily guarantee it, but... <laughs> It survived all this stuff. It might survive this too. And Best predictor so, of future is yeah. past. And <laughs> so, but but at the same time, you know, after after going through, not really working through only some of the episodes I worked through, but John's awakening from the meaning crisis, I, I very quickly saw that the cognitive science, the mm -hmm. the nomenclature, the terminology, the wisdom, and also just with John very quickly saw, you know, this is a, 
this is a person of peace, as the New Testament mm. calls it. This is a person that you can relate to and trust. This is the kind of conversation partner you really want when you're working outside mm. your tribe. Because so often you begin working with someone and they, they just they just get stuck sure. on something. And yeah. John um, is is so has done so much work on himself. And so that I'll I'll talk to John all day long. And um, and I think at this point we have enough of a relationship that hopefully he knows he can be honest with me. And I'm right. you know, I'm not gonna Oh, well, if you say that, I'm out of here. Right. Nah, I'm, well, I'm he'll different. apologize four times before it happens. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, John, take a chill, buddy. That's yeah. right. You're, you're all right. Hit me harder than that, John. You're into the martial arts. I mean, what, what are you, hitting people with feathers? Come on, hit me. Let me know what you're really doing. I'm from New Jersey. I'm from the East Coast. You're a polite Canadian. You know, cuss at me now and then or storm out of the room. You know, I pastored. I, I was, I remember a church meeting in the Dominican Republic. I was a missionary before that where, you know, overseas. And I remember a meeting that wasn't going so well for one pastor. And this, we were meeting in his building and he, he stormed out of the room and I hear so the, the, the church had a tin galvanized roof. I hear bang, bang. I'm like, what's going on? All the other pastors are just chilling. Like, there's like, oh, David's throwing rocks at the church. I'm like, <laughs> Is that normal? Oh yeah, when the meeting goes bad and he, he doesn't like something, he goes out and throws rocks at the church. But this is his church. Yeah, yeah, that's what he does. So, okay, so right. you know, well, I'm used to right. There's Canadians and rock throwing. So that's right. I'm I'm used to. I'm a I'm a local church pastor. I'm used to people <laughs> storming out of meetings. That's that's not an unusual thing. <laughs> so anyway, so no, and and so I also knew that a big problem of the church is its insularity and you know i might i might listen to some of what you say and say there's a fair amount of code talk that's going to trigger all these people over here the church has so much code talk and it just doesn't know how to talk in any other way gotcha. and there's so much boundary policing and religious organizations especially conservative ones which tend to be the really robust ones uh -huh. that any attempt to translate or even, you know, I'm going to, I'm going uh -huh. to talk to these people over here. I mean, you'll, the, the policing, you know, I understand uh -huh. the policing because when I started my channel, some of the most frequent emails I would get from people would be, you know, well, you shouldn't talk to that person because, right. okay, you know, all right, I, I'm not going to make you talk to them, but I am going to talk to them and I am going to listen to them. And I am going to, I, I appreciate the fact that you can lose yourself in the woods listening to other people. I get that. But I think, I think the church needs to be less insular if it actually wants to be of some good to the world around it. And that's a deep part of the Christian mission. So that's, beautiful. and well, that's a, so, yeah, that's where I'm at. Beautiful. No, it makes good sense. And uh, I certainly, uh, from my, obviously I'm on the outside, but I look into it and, and I deeply appreciate that initiative. And certainly that's very consistent with the kind of sensibilities I'm hoping people to wake up to from a wide variety of different positions in the world and believe that if we can, if a, if a large number of people start adopting that frame, I'm, much but it is it is important to me to and I know you know after I talked to Roman Catholics I, I fair amount of comments were oh you see the problem is institutions and it's like institutions are always a problem but we don't get anything done without them <laughs> no that's where all the, I mean all of the material power sit, you know, sits in the physical material solutions and the economic power and all of that so that's right uh, yeah that's right. no doubt that we, this is and that's one of my big fears is I don't know how the sensibility gets molded with the infrastructure and the complexification of the institutions and where they are. I don't know. But, you know, we'll do what our little little drop in the bucket that's the right. cosmos can do. And, that's exactly you know, right. That, that, that's, that's our little task and position in the world. Well, where can people find your stuff? Or, um, I mean, is there a link or anything that you'd like me to share with people in the notes here? Uh, sure, I'll give you my email. I talk to people, you know. Uh, so it, it's, you want uh, me to put your email on there? Yeah, sure. I'm All sure. right. 
<laughs> no, I, 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 I don't mean that to sound so sinister. And, and actually, my experience, you know, I look at Jordan and what, mm -hmm. you know, his status rocket. I often right. look at that and think, I, I wouldn't want that to happen to a friend. That that's that'd be scary. I, and listen, I'm I am trying to you know talk to lots of people and share some of my versions of reality. But at the same time, I, I'm not really keen on that. And so hate mail, you know, whatever. I'll probably just delete it if I get hate mail. But <laughs> I don't I don't think that. you'll get that. I think you'll <laughs> I I think actually my experience has been for the most part wonderful. Um, because I, I appreciate, I, I, I appreciate people disagreeing with me in a productive way. Mm -hmm. I grow from that. And Absolutely. so my experience with YouTube and with these little communities that have sort of sprung up have, have been, have been nearly universal, universally wonderful. So. Great. Well, I can, I'll send you some, how about I send you some links? Uh, yeah, send me some links and I'll put those and, and I'll probably, today is Thursday. I don't think I'll post this tomorrow. I'll probably post this Monday. So, um, so I'll probably go out Monday. Me. So, well, thank I you, really, Greg. This has been hey, a treat. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad that, you know, our lives got entangled around Jordan Peterson and then we were actually able to connect and see, see your work through John. And, you know, I really, I do appreciate this kinds of stuff as far as I'm concerned. This is very much uh, the you know seeds uh, that I hope get planted and grow around. So. All right. Well, take All care. Right. Good talking take to you. Take care. Good talking. Bye bye.